But as usual, let's start by kind of um, placing ourselves in, in the flow, thinking about focusing on where we are, uh, where we've come from, where we're on the path to, and, and the people who have brought us here, made this possible, whose mercy have, has made this possible. Of course, we start by paying our respects to Gurudev, our dear Gurudev Sadhu Maharaj, to his Gurudev, uh, Radha Govinda Das Babaji Maharaj. We think about and pay our respects to Prabhupada, Bhaktivedanta Prabhupada Maharaj, who gave us this translation, so important, and this commentary, which is so important to us, and the discovery of the connection to bhakti, which is so clear in the commentary, that's, which is really the, the aim of underlining in this, in, this, in this class. And we think about the six Goswamis, and in particular, the Rupa Goswami, who gave us the first interpretations of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's message, and then Raghunath Das Goswami, who brought it to life by living it so fully, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu again, and then of course Radha Mohan. And we remember the Acharyas, the people who have helped us to understand and to interpret, and then the Vaishnavas, that's you and me. <laughs> so the ones who are making the the flow of love and meaning continue, and that's that's you. And that's why it's so important to understand where you are, because you'll bring it on later to others, and they'll bring it on to others again. So I like to have a very wide idea of parampara, the succession of the divine. I think it has a very wide meaning that really goes down to every single living so and it's very important to remember that it doesn't start with us and it won't end with us. And that's, of course, a wonderful thing to, to, to know. Um, I want to remind us of four things that we talked about last time, four ideas that will come back again and again, and they come back again and again in Gurudev's teaching. The first one is the, the devotee relation. And it's on, on almost every page of the commentaries of Prabhupada, of Bhagavad Gita, that any sort of transmission of truth, any transmission of knowledge, and most importantly, any transmission of the divine happens only through relation which is loving which is devotional between devotees and devotees and guru. So the very condition for bringing the message is not logic or philosophy or books or studies, but rather loving relations. So this is why it's so important to do everything in our lives to, to um, cultivate that to make that grow, to make it bigger. And all the activities essentially we have, particularly the service activities and our work and our play and our relations with our partners and with our, with our family. These are all the place where loving relations happen and therefore the place where the divine can pass and be transmitted. So Bhagavad Gita has to be read. And I'm citing Prabhupada, Bhagavad Gita has to be read in that mood. If you don't read it with a loving feeling and with a loving devotion towards your guru and to the guru's guru and so forth, the, the, the divine will not find its way to you. That's the number one condition for doing bhakti. That's why seva and devotional service is so important. The second idea that comes around again and again is, of course, mercy, kripa. And when we, when we remember the souls in the disciplic succession that I just did, we're remembering the mercy they gave. The mercy they gave by letting the flow happen. 
I talked a, a bit about this, the first uh, lesson, that mercy is not about giving something concrete. It's not by, it's not about applying force or, or giving orders. There's no real message in it. Mercy is about letting happen, letting arrive, making a circumstance where the flow can happen, when we, where we can receive love, where we can receive the divine, where we can receive truth. So mercy is like opening up doors, opening up hearts. I think I said the first time uh, that mercy is about getting out of the way of God, just getting out of the way and letting it come. That's all we need to do. And this is what we do for each other. But above all, it's, it's what Guru does and what our Parampara does uh, for us, opening a space where this can happen, removing blockages and, and teaching us to remove blockages in our in our lives and the in the simple things we do day to day the way we work the way we deal with each other and i'm sitting in paris in the pouring rain and in french you might know it's probably the one no word that everybody knows merci which is derived directly from mercy means of course thank you merci means thank you but thanks for what well, thanks for nothing, and thanks for everything. And thanks for making uh, this possible by opening up our minds and our hearts. And sometimes I see that mercy, that word, or the word klipa, is translated into English as grace. You might have seen this, by the grace of Guru, by the grace of God, we, we say. And grace is uh, a really special word, too, because... It talks about something we didn't earn. So you have the grace of another hour of sleep, or we talk about giving grace to prisoners in prison. They, they're forgiven but for no reason. Uh, it's something you didn't earn. You don't have to do anything for it. It's yours because you are. This is what mercy is. It's something you already had without even asking for it. That's mercy. I want to re remind us of. The third idea that we talked about both days, the last two weeks, is Swarupa. And this is particularly important for Gurudev's teaching. Um, the Swarup is our, our eternal, uh, transcendental self, our soul. It's our transcendental form. It's who we really authentically are when we cut away all the, when we cut away all the, all the nonsense, all the material um, uh, covering. It's our spiritual self. Um, and the principle of mercy in Sarup is extremely important because we need someone to help us to find the way to our own Sarup, Sarupa. We seem to have a terrible time in finding it, to finding out who we are, finding our way back to who we are. And so maybe the most important way that Guru helps us is to show us to our own spiritual form, our own spiritual self. And once again, it's not something that you have to go out and get or, you know, spend money on or trade for or bargain for. Your svarupa is something you already have. It's already you. It's, it's something that's covered, though. And so finding the path to Svarupa is removing um, the covering, finding the way back to us, finding the way back to our who we who we really are. And so we read that last verse of the very last verse of Bhagavad Gita last time. And I'll, I'll reread it for you because it's so wonderful and it's so important also for Gurudev. It's verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 78, if you want to remember, but the very last page, just turn to the back. It says, the living entity, in its original position, is pure spirit. This is our svaru. So the living entity actually is, when it's in its normal position, its normal original position, it's svaru. It's the, that's, that's what we are. So it's already what, where we started, in a way. It's the original position. 
And now we're just going back. This is why Prabhupada talks about going back to God. And then I jump over to the last sentence, which says, um, by proper use of the devotee's independence, he comes under the direct order of Krishna. Thus, he attains his normal condition. Once again, that's Swarup. And that normal condition is in the pleasure-giving potency. And we talked last time about how pleasure-giving potency is Radharani. So she's the fourth thing I wanted to remind you of. It's almost silly in this audience to remind you of Radharani, but let's talk about her for just a moment. Um, any loving relation... And the model here in Bhagavad Gita is the loving relation between Arjuna, the, the devotee, and Krishna, the guru. Any loving relation is coming from Radharani, from that energy. So the pleasure giving potency is the loving energy of Radharani. Radha is, of course, the goddess of love. This goes way back in Vedantic literature. But in in our, in our uh, movement, in Gaudiya Vaishnavism, it, it appears as a kind of energy, the kind of energizing, loving um, force that, that holds everything together uh, in, in, the universe, in the universe. And it's the key to understanding Bhagavad Gita. But other more is that part of God that is pure, pure love, pure loving. She is the attraction for the all-attractive. So it's the one thing that attracts Krishna, as you know from the Raja. Uh, so there are four things to kind of review and meditate on, and I'm sure I'll mention them again as we, as we go along. Um, the devotee relation, mercy, um, Sarupa, and of course, our beloved uh, Radharam. Um, before I go any further, then I and and I want to go right to the the book now. This time, not. Is there any anything you want to comment on, or any questions, or anything to share? It would be a good time before we move on to some uh, to finish up with the introduction, really, for sure today. I promised it before. Of course, you can. You're welcome to share all along. It's not. Uh, Okay. Then let's just read together some some of the key points in the introduction to Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada's introduction. And the first one is where he talks about the five basic truths. Here, I'll, I'll show you the text on the screen here. But there you go. He talks about the five basic truths I'm on page seven of the introduction, except I'm not. Let's see. I'm going to be on page seven. Sixteen. There it is, right there at the bottom. The five basic truths. Does anybody want to read? Do you want to read the uh, punya? Oh, you're having your lunch. Sorry. Just some snacks. <laughs> and the sound's not very good either, actually. Okay. Sorry. So, David, you want to read? Can you see the screen? I can read. All right, I'll read. The subject of Bhagavad Gita entails the basic, the five basic truths, the following. First of all, the science of God is explained, and then the constitutional position of living entities or jivas. So in this book, uh, Bhagavad Gita, we're going to hear the science of God. 
the way that God works, not science in the modern natural science way, but the different ways that God works and uh, the way our reality is made up in relation to God, the way our reality is God. And then once that's explained, says Prabhupada, he's going to explain the constitutional position of living entities, jivas. Jivas, that's the individual living souls, that's, that's us. And here again, we have this expression that Gurudev often uses, the constitutional position. This is the Swarupa. This is the place where we start. It's the standing point. It's the starting point. It's the, it's the basis for our relationship to the world and to, and, and to God. So this is what we're trying to find through our practice. And it's basically what we're trying to find in Bhagavad Gita too. Find through the story of how devotional service takes place, devotional practice takes place. We try to find our way um, to that. So there's the jivas. Then there's the ishvara, which means controller. The living entities are controlled. Those are the jivas. And Ishvara, that's also an important term because it means not God or controller only, but it means personal God. Personal God. And the idea of personal God is really important, not only for Prabhupada and Bhagavad Gita, but for us, because only a personal God can be a loving God. Only a personal God can be a loved God. And only uh, a personal God can give expansions in the world to us jivas, which, is, which are also personal, loving, and, and loved. So God has many different names and many different forms in, in Hinduism. The three we talked about last week, we can mention them. The one is um, Brahman, which some people don't even translate as God. They say absolute reality. So it's the total universe, the total field of all things that are real and true in the universe. That's Brahman. And for some, this is God. But Brahman has no personality. Brahman has no no shape or, or, or variation or, or form or tenderness or this entire loving dimension is gone. Brahman is simply what is, what is the absolute um, reality, absolute being, if you like, to talk a bit more like a philosopher. So that's the one way of looking at God in, in Hinduism. The second way is um, Paramatma, the super soul. So if jivas all have atma, souls, then the super soul, paramatma, is God. And you might remember that atma in Hinduism is not just soul, it's also self. So there's no real idea in the West that corresponds to the idea of atma. Atma is not just the, the kind of thing that Christians believe leaves your body when you die and, and travels to heaven. It's also the self. So it's kind of a combination of who I am and my spiritual identity. They go together. This is very unusual in, in, the, in the Western context and sometimes difficult to, to gather. But then in, when we talk about Paramatma and Atma, Atma is the tiny little grains, the tiny little bits of Paramatma. In other words, there's a little bit of God in everyone. Every jiva has a little bit of God, and every jiva is part of making up what God is. This is what the expression part and parcel means. We come back, we see that a lot, and we'll come back to it even today. That God is in us, and we are in God, as self and as soul. So God as Paramatma. Then the third of the three types of God is Ishvara, the one we're talking about here. It's the controller. 
the one who controls, the one who has moods and a kind of emotion, feelings, love, a personality. So one big debate that Prabhupada was always involved in was whether God is personal or not. The impersonalists against the impersonalists. And in the in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, you have, sorry, not the Tibetan, the Mayaveda Buddhist, the, the one the Buddhism that moved to Japan and, and Korea and the East, it's impersonal. God is impersonal. To find God is to empty ourselves of all the all the uh, emotions, all the feelings, all the all the love. But in our tradition, and Prabhupada makes this case very strongly, it's a person, God is a personal thing, because only a person, personal God, a person girl, girl, a God with personality can have love and can, can share love. So that's where Ishvara, I just wanted to stop there and and explain that. That's where Ishvara fits into the 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 constellation of, of gods. So then we go on. We have uh, Pakriti, material nature. But this is not just nature like we talk about in the West, that it's what's out there in the world and it's different from us. It's, it's all the things that can be objects of our, of our senses. That's what Pakriti means. It's not just nature in the sense that we use in, in the West. It's all the things that our senses can touch and feel and hear and and smell and and see. So we have Ishvara, Jivas, Prakriti, time, and uh, the duration of existence of whole universe or the manifestation of material nature, and karma. Everybody knows this word, activity. Karma is activity. All living entities are engaged in different activities under the rule of karma. From Bhagavad Gita, we must learn what God is, Ishvara, what the living entities are, the Jiva, what Prakriti is, what the cosmic manifestation is, and how it is controlled by time, and what the activities of living entities are. That's just about everything you can think of to want to learn in a book, I think. So that's the that's the five basic truths that he wants to he wants to talk about. And then there's this idea of part and partial, which he's going to talk about right below, I think. If I'm not wrong. Yeah. Right below now I'm on page seven still at the bottom. And he says, the Supreme Lord is a driver under whose direction everything is working. So he's the controller of material nature. Now, the jivas, or the living entities, have been accepted by the Lord, as we will note later, in later chapters, as his parts and parcels. A particle of gold is also gold. A drop of water from the ocean is also salty. And similarly, we are the living entities being part and parcel of the supreme controller, Ishvara, or Bhagavan. Bhagavan, of course, is another word for God. Lord Shri Krishna have all the qualities of the supreme Lord in minute quantity, because we are minute Ishvaras, subordinate Ishvaras. Really, really beautiful and important idea in Hinduism and Bhakti is exactly this. We don't have this in the West either. The idea that each of us is a little ray of sunshine coming from the sun. Each of us is a particle of gold, but still gold. Each of us is a tiny Ishvara, a tiny God, finding our way to finding our way to to our to our Swarup. And all this, he says, is what is going to be explained in uh, in Bhagavad Gita, very ambitious, very ambitiously. 
And we go on to the next paragraph about material nature. Prakriti. What is material nature, he asks? Well, this is also explained in Gita as inferior prakriti, inferior nature, which is everything outside of the living entity, and then the living entity explained as superior prakriti. So prakriti has two, two kinds, the kinds that are in the living entities and the kind that are outside of the living entities. And we'll come back to the different ways, the different levels of energy that, that organize uh, prakriti and the material world, the subtle, the gross, and the material. But prakriti is always under control, whether inferior or superior. And now prakriti is female, and she is controlled by the Lord, just as the activities of a wife are controlled by the husband. Prakriti is always subordinate, predominated by the Lord, who is the predominator. So God, Krishna, creates the material world, sets up, if you like, the rules, the way it can run, the rules according to which it runs, the, the basic rules according to which living entities can function as well, and then lets us go to find our, to find our way. So there's some autonomy, but there's also some control. The living entities and material nature are both predominated, controlled by the Supreme Lord. According to the Gita, the living entities, although parts and parcels of the Lord, are to be considered prakriti. And then we'll move on to the gunas, to the qualities of material reality. This is on uh, page nine, I think, of, of the Prabhupada edition of Bhagavad Gita. There are three, well, I'll read. Prakriti itself is constituted by three qualities. And these are also called gunas, this word you've heard many times. Above these modes, there is eternal time. And by a combination of these modes of nature and under the control, and purview of eternal time, there are activities which are called karma. Those activities are being carried out from time immemorial, immemorial, and we are suffering or enjoying the fruits of our activities according to the rules of karma. For instance, suppose I am a businessman and have worked very hard with intelligence and have amassed a great bank balance, then I am an enjoyer. But then say I have lost all money in business, then I am a sufferer. Some, similarly, in the field of life, we enjoy the results of our work or we suffer the results. This is karma. Karma is also cause and effect. It means basically action, doesn't it? But it means the rules governed by the controller, Krishna, the rules that govern the way that action takes place. So the cause and effect, everything that happens has some sort of result. Results that we cannot always control and should not even seek to, to control. Good results, bad results. And these have results not only in this life, but in life that comes uh, beyond uh, after it. Okay, there are two more ideas I want to present to you before we move to chapter nine. Let's see. The first one is consciousness. This is on page 10 of the book edition of Bhagavad Gita. 
at the bottom here. The Supreme Consciousness, I'm sorry, Supreme Conscious Ishvara is similar to the living entity in this way. Both the consciousness of the Lord and that of the living entity are transcendental. Both the consciousness of the Lord and that of the living entity are transcendental. That's a very strange thing to say. What does that mean? Of course, the consciousness of the Lord is transcendental. That's what we would expect. The Lord is transcendental. His consciousness is transcendental too. But what about the jiva, us? Our consciousness is transcendental? Well, yes, this is our path to our svarup. This is our path to the, the, the divine level, the divine world, the transcendental world. Even where we are as material beings, we can find our way there through proper practice, and meditation, and prayer. So the transcendental world is already available to us as material beings. We do devotion in relationship to the transcendental world. We do our meditation and, 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 and chanting and so forth in relation to the transcendental world. So we're not entirely living in the transcendental as God is, as Krishna is. He's entirely in the transcendental level. But we have a relationship with it. We can always sense it. Some of us are more sensitive to it than others. We're all seeking to sense it more and more to increase our experience of the transcendental. So we all, each and every jiva, has a relationship to the transcendental. Another beautiful, beautiful idea that is completely different from what we teach in, in the West, in Christianity or Islam or Judaism. And there the transcendental world is a completely different place, a completely different um, level. So Prabhupada goes on, this consciousness is not consciousness generated by the association of matter. That makes perfect sense. It's not just by rubbing sticks together we have consciousness. Uh, can you slow down just a bit? I think Madhuri Raza is... Go down? <laughs> like that? Just slow, just slow down, I think, because Madhuri Raza has some... It's too fast for translation, I think. Just saying. I'm going too fast, okay. Yes. Is, is this better now? Yeah, just, just, just uh, a bit well, slower, 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 slow, slow, slow down. Slow, I, slow, slow down. Yeah. I heard go so, down, so I put the... No, 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 sorry. Slow okay. Down. Yes, I'm so, sorry, Madhuya Rasa. You're a superhero. So, jivas have a relation with the transcendental. Consciousness does not come through material relations alone. Consciousness does not come from relating to material things. Consciousness uh, comes from relating to the transcendental, things that are above and beyond material things. We can always relate to things in a banal way, but to relate to what's to the divine level, we need to relate to other people and other consciousness. This is why, of course, relation Association is so important for us. So I read some more. The theory that consciousness develops under certain circumstances of material combination is not accepted in Bhagavad Gita.
consciousness may be pervertedly reflected by the covering of material circumstances, just as light reflected through colored glass may appear to be have a color. But the consciousness of the Lord is not materially affected. So sometimes we think, when we look at material objects, we think that we see consciousness. Hmm? But consciousness comes from our relationship to the, to the transcendental. There's a very cute story about Prabhupada when he was in California. He had a debate with a scientist. And the scientist said, there's no such thing as transcendental consciousness. And Prabhupada said, yes, there is, of course. And by chance, somewhere in San Francisco, apparently there's a museum a museum of the human body. And in this museum, they have collected all the material parts of a human body in little jars and big jars, and all the elements, every single one, every single element that makes up a human body. So essentially, everything about the material side of a human. And so Prabhupada argued to the scientist, well, if there's no transcendental soul, then why can't we just mix all of the elements together and make a new human being? Just to make the point that human existence must be more than the sum of the components of the material human body. And this is essentially what's saying here. In order to be human, we have to have a relation to the transcendental, a consciousness of the, the, the transcendental. Even if we do not pay attention to it at every moment. And the meaning of our practice is exactly that, to pay attention to it. The meaning of our practice is to be attentive to the transcendental side of our consciousness, to make it grow, to make it bigger, to make it deeper and richer. That's why we do our devotional practice. I read on, Lord Krishna says, Maya Diak Shena Pakrit, which means, which means I am the administrator of Prakriti of natural, of the natural material world. When he descends into the material universe, his consciousness is not materially affected. If he were affected, he would be unfit to speak on transcendental matters as he does in Bhagavad Gita. One cannot say anything about the transcendental world without being free from materially contaminated consciousness. So once again, this is the key to our practice. We cannot know anything about 
the transcendental world, unless we clean our material consciousness, unless we become free from our material consciousness, unless we do the house cleaning of our consciousness and make it pure, take away the distractions about material things. And in that way, we can find our way to the transcendental world. Without that, we're only in material consciousness. We cannot see the transcendental world. And then I continue, the, the Lord is not materially contaminated, but our consciousness is, at the present moment, materially contaminated. Bhagavad Gita teaches that we have to purify this materially contaminated consciousness. So basically, in the part that we're the part of Bhagavad Gita that we're going to hop over, the first six chapters, this is this is explained. We'll come back to them later. It will be by next year, I think. The first six chapters of Bhagavad Gita describe the way we can purify our consciousness and and, and make a, a relationship to our own soul. That's the foundation of the house. That's the foundation of Bhagavad Gita. And then in the second part of Bhagavad Gita, the part we're going to read, we learn about devotional service, about loving relation. And this is our goal. So Gurudev wanted us to start by clarifying the goal devotional service. And then afterwards, we'll come back to the part about strengthening the relation to soul. In pure consciousness, in pure consciousness, our actions will be dovetailed, linked together with the will of Ishvara. And that will make us happy. In other words, it will be natural for us to do God's will. We won't do it because of rules or laws or instructions. We will rise to the point where what we want is what God wants. What God wants is what we want. Completely natural. <clears throat> No force, no coercion, no power. It will be completely, completely natural. This is why I said uh, last week, the difference between a disciple and a devotee, a disciple does what I say, a devotee feels what I feel. We want to be devotees and feel what God feels. The way to feel what God feels is through what we call Manjari Bhav. Manjari Bhav is the perfectly, the perfect empathy, having the same feelings as Radharani, the same loving feelings. And by adapting that, mood, we can come as close as possible to God. And dovetail then, that's the word dovetail, like this dovetail with Ishvara. I continue, it is not that we have to cease all activities. Rather, our activities have to be purified. And purified activities are called bhakti. This too is very important. It doesn't matter, it matters little what our activities are. 
What matters is that we do our activities with good intention. We cannot be attached to the result of our activities, but we can be concerned about the way, the mood in which we do our activities. So a purified activity is not the one that has the best result. A purified job is not the one that makes the most money. A purified activity is the one that is most done in the mood of love. That's a pure activity. And we aim in our, in our work, in our play, in our relations, to do everything with that mood. The more that we can bring loving relations to all our activities, to cleaning the house, to going to work, to playing with the kids, all these things, if they're done with loving mood, without attachment to the result, just doing it for doing it, then we can find our way to pure consciousness. From the outside, pure activities look the same. We read on, Prabhupada says, activities in bhakti appear to be like ordinary activities. They look just like any activities. But the difference is they are not contaminated. An ignorant person may see that a devotee is working like an ordinary man. But such a person with a poor fund of knowledge, an ignorant person, does not know that the activities of the devotee of the Lord are not contaminated by impure consciousness or matter. This is another way that Guru helps us in our activities. Sometimes we can't even see when our activities are pure or impure. Sometimes we are too ignorant to know whether we're doing things with a pure heart. And Guru, one way Guru helps us is to, to show us the mood by example and by teaching, to show us the mood of doing activities with pure consciousness. So when, to finish this point, then the activities that are not contaminated, they are transcendental to the three modes of nature. The three modes of nature, the three gunas that we talked about uh, before. Passion, ignorance, and goodness. So we transcend the gunas. The more we purify our activities, the more we transcend the gunas. Then the last idea that we want to talk about today is this idea of impersonalism that I mentioned. That's so important for for Bhakti and very important for for Prabhupada. Here it is. Now I'm on page twelve. And it, Prabhupada says, it is explained in the Gita that impersonal Brahman is also subordinate to the complete. So impersonal Brahman was the one of the three kinds of 
God forms that we have. Hmm? The Ishvara, the Brahman, and the Parampara. So, sorry, the Paramatma. So here he says that the impersonal Brahman is under the total God, inferior to it, subordinate to the complete whole of God. So God is more than impersonal Brahman. God, Krishna, has to be more than impersonal Brahman. He has to have personality. He has to have loving qualities. So this is a way, a way of saying that the personal God, the God that Prabhupada sees and Bhakti sees, is greater, bigger, and stronger, and more important than, than Brahman. Brahman is more explicitly explained in the Brahma Sutra, to be like the rays of the sunshine. That's very good, it's very important. But nonetheless, Prabhupada is critical. He says the impersonal Brahman is the shining rays of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It's the way it shines out, expands, disseminates. But impersonal Brahman, he says, is incomplete. Incomplete realization of the absolute whole. And also, incomplete is Paramatma. Let me talk about this in 12th chapter. In the 12th chapter, we'll see that the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Purusatama, is above both personal Brahman and Paratma, Paramatma. So the personal God is above. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is above all of those. I can skip down a little bit. And he says, impersonal Brahman, realization, is the realization of Sat. Sat is what is, reality, what, what is being. And this is part of what God is. God is what exists, the absolute reality of everything that is. So that's the Sat. A very important word in Sanskrit, sat. And we have asat, which means something that doesn't exist. And then paramatma, realization, is realization of chit, of knowledge, eternal knowledge, perfect knowledge. So we have things that are the, the sat. We, think we have things that we know, the chit. But we need something more. What is the thing more we need? It's the personality. Or here he's calling it Adanda. I'll read on a little bit. But realization of the personality of Godhead, Krishna, is realization of all the transcendental features. Sat, being, chit, knowledge, and Ananda, bliss or pleasure. So this tells us something very, very beautiful and important about what God is, about what Krishna is. Krishna is everything that is. Krishna is all knowledge. But more importantly, Krishna is all emotion, all feeling, all bliss, ananda. Sat, chit, and ananda, all together in one. And this is why Prabhupada and others say that Krishna is not formless, it's not impersonal, but personal and the source of love, the source of a loving uh, personality. And of course, maybe we can stop on this point, uh, the, the main energy of that Ananda is the Radharani. The component of God that has that loving personalism to it is Radharani, the part that we are seeking to become close with.
There we go. I do think we'll stop there. That's about the end of what I wanted to talk about in the introduction. So then now next week we can start with chapter nine of the of the main part of the text of the Gita. Any thoughts or comments or questions? Punyam's just smiling. I don't know what that means. I hope it means you're happy. Radhe Radhe. So, Uddhava, in um, in this area, Native American um, connection to God is so strong, and and to my understanding, it's all through, you know, appreciating the earth and connecting to the earth, and mm. and so now through these teachings, I'm understanding that that is the the impersonal Brahman realization. Is that correct? <clears throat> I really don't know anything about Indian Native American, uh, Native American uh, spirituality. But wouldn't they say that, um, that, this, that the soul, the spirit is in the earth? Just the way that um, we would say that? Mm. That... Um, I, I, I'm not so. I'm not sure about your question, but I think that they would see the soul in the, a kind of super soul in the earth. But where this, whether the super soul is, is loving, has bliss, this personality that we talk about in bhakti. I don't. I don't know about that. It's a beautiful, beautiful question. Mm. Are you saying like Mother Earth? Are you saying this Mother Earth, or is this? <laughs> I also know because then I have also I personally well even if like you say mother, then maybe they also have some picture in their mind of how they think mother earth looks like and then if there's isn't there, if there's like a name like mother or father or something then there's also a relation no? mm. I don't know, this is why Absolutely, mm. yeah. I mean the loving the the character of the the world is gendered like that and the soul of course is is feminine and the and the earth we just read a moment ago that Prakriti is 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 feminine as well. So the mother, that's where the mother earth idea comes from. Hmm. Yes, I that that really resonates because there's something different about saying planet and right. verse speaking of like mother earth and like her expression through the sun and through the mountains and through the rivers. And, and so that does make more, more, more personal as. um, Hmm. Yeah. hmm. Very nice. So the planet itself is kind of a lifeless. So it sounds like a lifeless material object. One that's just going on on itself, like um, without a soul. But when you talk about the earth, then it has a richness to it, a depth to it. Is that what you mm. mean? That's very nice. Mm. But don't the Native Americans have a an idea about um, about the cycle of life? That's a lot like uh, a lot like uh, Hinduism. That is that um, that uh, everything comes from the earth, everything goes back to the earth, and it's 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 a continuous process that has no real beginning or end. Um, yeah, that's how I imagine. To my, yeah, to my understanding, yes, they do, and so that is. Yeah, I guess I the the question I just. Brahman was um, the the point about Brahman just being like the rays of the sun. Um, that reading in here, and just I haven't ever really understood Brahman. And so many people, 
you know, especially in the West, they do connect to spirit and to um, something higher through the mm. earth. And, and so yeah. this conversation is helping yeah. me understand you know, and, and understand how to, how to make more meaning and, and sweetness through, you know, seeing it in a, in a relationship way and in a, um, well, really in the mood of Radharani is like, okay, we can find loving connection here. Yeah. Through this way. Yeah. No, I follow. I follow. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Prabhupada's not saying that Brahman's somehow unimportant or or wrong, not at all. He's mm -hmm. saying that there's that's everything that is, which is already quite beautiful and has a kind of spiritual nature to it. But he's saying there's something more, mm -hmm. and that's the loving relation. Can I say something? I, I like this explanation of your A lot of people are Walking in the in the night and you see a light, a bright light, it's like a car coming towards you. At the beginning, you just see like light, and you maybe understand oh, there's it's a car, car coming, but you don't know the color of the car, what brand it is. This you don't know, so you just know okay, it's a light and it's coming towards me. But then, if it comes closer. Then you see the form of the car and the brand and the color, and then you understand more. So it's mm. like this explanation of yeah. yeah. Very nice. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Okay. Well, next week we'll look at chapter nine then at last. Mm. Which has more on this question too, actually. So, a bit more to talk about. So, I just want me to say, I want to ask me if you want to say what. First, spark, then light, and then form. Okay. <laughs> spark, light, and then form. First, you want to see very far. Yeah. Something, something uh, flimmering in the distance, and then more. Okay. Big lights, and then, then the form. Exactly.